Well, um, thyroidectomy, surgical, nuclear, and molecular insights. Uh, my talk is a tale of two knives uh, called steel knife and the uh, beta knife, the hot beta knife. And also a little introduction to a third one, perhaps. The saga starts uh, at the turn of the century with Dr. Coker. Dr. Coker to us, to the surgeons, is known to be uh, the Anna Domini of thyroid surgery. Before Dr. Coker, the mor morbidity of thyroid operations were as high as 75%. It was so bad that uh, it, the thyroid operations were banned by uh, French Medical Association. Even uh, famous Dr. Bilroth had a very high morbidity rate. Uh, these all changed uh, when Dr. <clears throat> Coker started using his uh, elegant surgical technique. Uh, Dr. Hosted's account on Dr. Uh, Coker's technique uh, reads this. Coker, neat and precise, operating in a relatively bloodless manner, scrupulously removed the entire thyroid gland, doing little damage outside its capsule. This made a big difference. During his lifetime, he performed about 5,000 uh, more than 5,000 uh, thyroidectomies with uh, less than 1% uh, mortality. Uh, today, we reached to a point that our mortality is zero, thank God. Uh, Halstead himself was fascinated with thyroid operations, and he famously said, uh, the extirpation of the thyroid gland typifies, perhaps better than any operation, the supreme triumph of the surgeon's art. But for, uh, for some uh, reason, he chose to continue his career in uh, breast surgery. Hosted to us uh, is known as the Anna Domini of surgical oncology. He uh, planted the scientific basis of modern surgical oncology. Uh, he is the one who came up with radical mastectomy idea based on the concept that there was an orderly progression of cancer uh, from the primary site to lymph nodes and then uh, to the systemic uh, circulation. Although not exactly true uh, with today's understanding of uh, cancer uh, propagation, this was a major change and uh, the mortality morbidity rates of uh, close to 50% uh, for breast operations went down to 6% initially and then uh, to a negligible level. And uh, this concept of lymph node involvement in cancer uh, and the fact that they needed to be taken care of dominated the next at least 60 years in surgical oncology. Sir Moynihan uh, of England also very famously said that surgery of cancer is not the surgery of the organs, but their lymphatics. And again, this concept dominated surgical oncology. How did this translate into uh, thyroid surgical oncology? Uh, one of the giants at the time is Dr. Frank Leahy. Uh, these, these are the quotations from him. Uh, when the carcinoma, uh, carcinoma has involved one lobe, it is unnecessary to perform a total thyroidectomy and remove the unaffected lobe, 1940. Uh, but then, he makes a comment on the neck dissection and says, radical and extensive neck dissection should be done. This figurement is one of the prices patients must pay to obtain the benefits of radicalness of the operation, 1949, nine years after. Uh, and during this period, uh, most surgeons did extensive radical mastectomy, radical neck dissections, sacrificing sternocleidomastoid muscle, IJ, even the uh, mandibular branch of uh, the facial nerve. It was a very morbid operation. Parallel to the surgical uh, thoughts and uh, attitudes, the definition of thyroid carcinoma uh, started showing progress. In 1940, by Dr. Leahy's group, uh, the, the classification you see on the left was proposed. This mentions papillary carcinoma, alveolar carcinoma, adenocarcinoma is uh, what we call uh, follicular carcinoma today uh, with minus the uh, 
uh, follicular colloid, Herto cell adenocarcinoma. Uh, the person who is not all that well known to uh, many uh, young surgeons is uh, Dr. George Kreil. He was the first one to oppose this radical approach to thyroid cancer operations. Very insightfully, he observed that uh, most papillary thyroid cancer patients had a very uh, indolent course. They did not die of uh, cancer. They did not suffer uh, extensive nodal metastases and neck disease. And throughout his life, he opposed the radical approaches at the time dominated uh, the, the field initiated by Dr. Halstead. Uh, and he proposed more conservative approaches. The classification of thyroid cancer by him included again, papillary carcinoma and non-papillary carcinoma under which he uh, places adenocarcinoma, angio-invasive adenomas and undifferentiated carcinomas. The reason I'm giving this parallel uh, with uh, thyroid uh, pathology is that until this time point, there is no mention of differentiated thyroid cancer or well-differentiated thyroid cancer. A famous quote by uh, Kriel is that radicality of the operation should be against the disease, not to the patient. In the meantime, while uh, the surgical uh, world is advancing, uh, hopefully towards uh, less conservative operations, radioactive iodine was uh, conceptualized. And this was the birth of a uh, beta knife. Dr. Saul Hertz's um, idea came up in 1936, 37, first radioactive iodine isotope was made. And in 1941, first hyperthyroid patient was treated with radioactive iodine by Dr. Hertz. Uh, since the beginning, everybody was interested in treating thyroid cancer with radioactive iodine. And this is a, a paper that was published by Dr. Hertz in 1946. He had some ideas, but he had some concerns about uh, thyroid cancer uh, uh, and treating thyroid cancer with radioactive iodine. He says, certain tumor types do have limited capacity for retaining radioactive iodine. These iodide retaining types are the exception and would seem that in only such cases in which one can demonstrate uh, such favorable uptake by tracer studies is the hope of radiotherapeutic dosage to be entertained, 1946. He has serious concerns, concerns that uh, thyroid cancer may not accumulate enough radi uh, radioactive iodine and be treated successfully. Uh, in 1949, uh, a very popular magazine, Life magazine, October 31st, published an interesting medical article, which uh, the heading of which said, radioiodine halts one type of cancer. Um, this was a report of an earlier treatment uh, by Dr. Seidlin of uh, Montefiore Hospital in New York. Actually, the first cut was made in uh, May 1943. And it was published in 1946 in JAMA. And this was the publication in uh, Life Magazine 1949. The patient presented with uh, hyperthyroidism. Uh, from what we know today, uh, we can speculate that uh, this was a RAS type of tumor, um, overly active, causing clinical hyperthyroidism. And sure enough, was very successfully treated with uh, radioactive iodine. The appearance of this uh, article in Life magazine uh, instantly was embraced by the uh, medical community. And ever since, radioactive iodine treatment of uh, thyroid cancer was very popular. In the meantime, scientific studies uh, concentrated on the concentration of radioactive iodine in thyroid cancer. Uh, this is a very elegant autoradiographic mapping performed by Dr. Fitzgerald of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, published in 1950, looking at iodine concentration. These patients were administered radioactive iodine prior to their surgical treatment. 
uh, a number of cases, a total of 100 cases actually, uh, the cases included uh, normal thyroids, adenomas, and uh, both follicular and papillary carcinomas. Uh, this study very nicely showed that uh, while uh, the um, normal thyroid is uh, accumulating radioactive iodine in a nice homogeneous way, uh, this was not the case with many thyroid cancers. Here you see in, uh, intense uh, radioactivity just next to a malignant tissue. Here again, uh, islands of uh, radioactive iodine accumulation and negative iodine uptake in the remaining um, malignant tissue. The, page, the paper concludes with uh, numbers, interesting numbers. Papillary carcinomas uh, in their primary is only 11%. Uh, metastatic lesions in 38% and total of 25% uh, showing significant amount of uh, radioactive iodine uh, accumulation. Alveolar and follicular is, th these numbers are 66, 84, and 77. And uh, in solid, it's 50, 31, and 39. Solid corresponds what we call today uh, poorly differentiated carcinomas. So it was known, observed early on, that there was something deficient about uh, radioactive iodine deposition in malignant thyroid lesions. Again, uh, Dr. Rawson of uh, Harvard, uh, in one case, very nicely demonstrated that the only way to improve iodine uptake in the malignant thyroid tissue was to perform total thyroidectomy so that you eliminate the normal thyroid, which would um, essentially absorb uh, most of the radioactive iodine and would not let radioactive iodine directed to the metastatic sites. So this is uh, known as Rawson principle. And in a, a very famous textbook, Dr. Beerwaltes, uh, who is one of the pioneers in nuclear medicine, and who has set the guidelines, uh, most of them arbitrarily and rightfully. Uh, he had an extensive knowledge in uh, uh, radioisotope uh, science. Uh, he summarized radioactive iodine and thyroid cancer relationship. He said less than 50% of thyroid cancers pick up measurable amounts of radioactive iodine. The tumor with the highest functional activity Reported to be reported to have only 40% of the normal thyroid uptake capacity. All other tumors have been reported to have radioactive iodine uptake of less than 3%. And he concluded to say by saying, first duty of the radioactive iodine user is to make sure that the carcinoma will concentrate I-131 to uh, therapeutic levels, 1957. So total thyroidectomy everyone agreed then, is the only measure proved to increase radioiodine uptake in metastases. This is what I call as coupling of radioactive iodine with total thyroidectomy. The rationale of performing total thyroidectomy as set as early as in 1950s was to help uh, radioactive iodine to be redirected to metastatic sites which by definition have depressed uh, met metabolic potential to deal with iodine. How did uh, this conclusion uh, affect uh, the clinical practice? There are two interesting papers. One is from Mayo Clinic, and the other one is from Nehi Clinic. These are addressing the surgical, um, surgical approaches to uh, thyroid carcinoma. Mayo Clinic data uh, looked at the cases between 1946 and 70, 859 patients. Between the uh, years of 46 and 49, 73% of the operations were lobectomy. This dropped down to 43% between 50 and 54. And after 55, when uh, the beer Waltes effect was in effect, uh, nobody was doing uh, lobectomy anymore. Um, bilateral subtotal thyroidectomy became a popular operation along with total thyroidectomy 
that comprise 95% of the operations, dropping the lobectomy uh, to uh, 5%. What happened to the uh, lymph node dissection? That was addressed by Lehi Clinical uh, Clinic data, looking at 1930 through 1970 trends, 792 patients between the years of 31 and 40, uh, radical, uh, no, radical neck dissection was 38%. This went up to 88% during 41 and 50, uh, peaked at 92% and 51 to 60. This was the heights of um, Halstedian concept dominating surgical oncology. And it started uh, going down drastically between 61 and 70. Uh, it went down uh, approximately a little more than, a little over than 50%. And this is what I call the cryo effect. Today, we reached to a point that up until recently, up until uh, the, the 19, I mean, 2009 uh, guidelines, we used to do standard routine central neck dissections. Uh, that was put on trial. Uh, and the routine use of central uh, neck dissection, selective ne uh, neck dissection is also not being performed uh, at the present time. How did we end up with this uh, well-differentiated thyroid uh, cancer term? Um, I did an extensive search on this uh, and finally concluded that this was a conspiracy published in 1968 uh, by a British surgeon, Dr. Selvin, uh, Selvin Taylor. Selvin Taylor said, uh, well, there's differentiated and undifferentiated thyroid cancers. Differentiated thyroid cancers are papillary, follicular, and medullary. And he claimed that this was first proposed in 1931 and uh, well established in 1961. I pulled out both uh, articles. They're not really uh, correct. Uh, the term differentiated is used, but no uh, differentiated thyroid cancer term was used up until this particular paper. So uh, like most, uh, uh, most everybody uh, that I know, we blame, uh, blame this on uh, Mr. Churchill, although in 1968, he already had passed. He died in 1965. So uh, a little anecdote here is uh, philosophical problems are created by misguided attempts to consider the meaning of words independently of their context. So this, term of differentiated thyroid cancer did a lot of harm because when you say differentiated, what I understand is uh, the tumor looks like uh, thyroid and acts like thyroid, which is not exactly the case in uh, many, uh, many times and ty types and forms of papillary cancer. And the whole literature uh, starting from 1968 dominated by this term, differentiated thyroid cancer. Everybody used this term, surgeons jumped on it, nuclear medicine physicians jumped on it. Um, one of the earliest nuclear medicine textbooks started using the word well differentiated, uh, differentiated thyroid cancer term was not enough. The only people who actually resisted the term were the pathologists. And um, surgical pathology of thyroid, AFIP, WHO classifications, None of the classifications use the word uh, well differentiated. And then finally, the term made it to ATA guidelines. All 2006, 9, and 15 versions have the differentiated thyroid cancer term. Well, uh, reality is how you perceive the facts. Well differentiated, everybody thought well differentiated is well treated uh, and well responsive to radioactive iodine. And I think that is the misconception. If you look at the embryonic life and the adult life, there is no uh, morphologic phase that uh, thyroid tissue goes through a papillary uh, morphology or even papillary nuclear uh, features. This is the latest and the greatest by uh, Dr. Nikki Foro. Um, malignant tumors of uh, follicular cell origin are papillary carcinomas, follicular carcinomas, herter cell carcinomas, uh, poorly differentiated and anaplastic carcinomas. So uh, essentially 
the oncogenesis of thyroid cancer is an indifferentiation process. Everybody talked about this topic, uh, uh, of course, mentioned about the signal transduction in the thyroid cells. Uh, the most common signal transduction venues uh, and for thyroid cancer are uh, MEP kinase pathway and uh, PI3K pathways. In this slide, I'm not going to talk about PI3K, uh, but MEP kinase not only uh, uh, is the most important one, and it's shared by lots of driver, driver mutations. Uh, the most common two driver mutations in um, uh, thyroid cancer obviously are RAS and BRAF mutations. Uh, when you have uh, mutations in these uh, molecules in the uh, signal transduction, uh, the stimulation starts the cascade of activation events, uh, finally activating ERK in the cytoplasm, which translocates in the nucleus. ERK activates and deactivates a number of uh, transcription factors. One major route uh, is the cell cycle activation and proliferation, uh, the, the common denominator of uh, oncogenesis and uh, the hallmark of uh, cancer progression. ERK also uh, shuts off uh, the transcription factors involved in uh, in production of the thyroid-specific transcription factors, which are involved in uh, generation of transcription of uh, the enzymes that now we list under thyroid differentiation score. In the 2014 paper, uh, there are 16 genes listed, and all of these are uh, to a different level are shut down uh, based on the ERK output, MAP kinase ERK output. And this mechanism is what indifferentiates uh, thyroid cancer and sh sh shutting off the uh, iodine metabolism. There is a clear uh, reverse relationship with ERK and TDS. Uh, higher the ERK score, lower the thyroid differentiation score. This has been demonstrated Many times, Dr. Fagan nicely showed the same. We actually took the raw data and uh, run it uh, in our computer uh, and uh, obtained the same findings. Uh, BRAF-like, RAS-like tumors, ERK signature, uh, BRAS-RAF uh, signature, and clinical risk factors, they were all tabulated against the, uh, the um, heat map of... Uh, thyroid differentiation uh, gene expressions. BRAF-like tumors have uh, suppressed differentiation gene expressions, whereas RAS-like tumors preserve to a decent degree uh, the iodine handling capacity. On the far, far right, you, th this is the normal thyroid expression. Again, TDS is uh, inversely uh, related with ERK and uh, in RAS type tumors, the TDS is well preserved as opposed to uh, BRAF tumors. BRAF tumors uh, and uh, TDS score correlation. So, therapeutic and therapeutic, uh, and therapeutic power of radioactive iodine. In lieu of all uh, these observations and uh, revelations, where do we stand in terms of radioactive iodine uh, therapeutic power? Well, differentiated thyroid cancer is, in my opinion, a misleading term. <laughs> At best, it's a misdifferentiated thyroid cancer. The fact that it has a nice papillary structures doesn't make it a well differentiated. As far as I am concerned, well differentiation refers to handling of iodine physiology. Therapeutic significance of total thyroidectomy is coupled on to radioactive iodine therapy. 90% of the time, we do total thyroidectomies to uh, help radioactive iodine therapy. Therapeutic power of radioactive iodine in misdifferentiated thyroid cancer is misgaged due to the tumor indifference to the radioactive iodine. Molecular theranostics has the potential to gauge the degree of indifference and allow appropriate interventions. 
yes, thyroid differentiation is defined per the iodine physiology. This is a phenomenal evolutionary uh, perspective. The thyroid gland in mammals is the most advanced system storing and handling iodine. Uh, the outside world is an iodine deficient milieu and the highest concentration of the uh, iodine in, in, in the world is in thyroid gland. And uh, it's a result of an endless adaptation of millions of years of uh, evolution, starting from uh, primitive marine animals when they left the sea and uh, went on to the land. Uh, molecular profile and TDS of uh, profile of thyroid cancers uh, in different types of cancers in a different uh, publication. This is a more recent publication, 2009. Um, Follicular adenomas and micro-invasive uh, follicular thyroid cancers, they preserve their uh, thyroid differentiation uh, uh, ability, whereas uh, widely infiltrated follicular thyroid cancers drop significantly. As far as the PTC is concerned, uh, this has been de uh, repeatedly demonstrated. Uh, BRAF type uh, has almost universal uh, depression in uh, uh, thyroid differentiation. Uh, RAS tumors to a reasonable extent uh, maintain their uh, radioactive iodine differentiation. ATC is uh, obviously completely sh shut off and uh, comparison to the normal thyroid. Um, Aggressive cancers molecular profile, uh, there's a disparity uh, between morphology and thyroid differentiation score. Uh, one could uh, uh, interpret this data differently. The way I uh, see this data is as follows. Now, uh, there are different types of cancers listed. ATC is what I uh, put yellow uh, around these uh, squares. Uh, most of the ATC tumors are in the lower TDS score zone. But interestingly enough, there are ATC uh, uh, tumors also represented under uh, reasonable TDS numbers uh, along with uh, BRAF tumors, even some of the RAS tumors. So this tells me that there is a potential even in uh, the most undifer seemingly undifferentiated, morphologically definitely undifferentiated forms, uh, there may be a preservation of the potential of redifferentiation. This is obviously a, a speculation. Um, Hertel cell cancer, the situation in Hertel cell cancer also deserves a um, uh, more careful approach. Um, there is a Minimally in capsular invasive types and widely capsular invasive types differentiated with distinctly different clinical out, uh, outcomes. And uh, the, the unfavorable, the, the group with unfavorable uh, thyroid differentiation score, 60% of them are uh, uh, Hertel cells with wide uh, capsular invasion, and 40% uh, is with uh, minimum capsular invasion. What's interesting is uh, the widely, widely capsular invading type, six out of 21 in this publication, they were under uh, the favorable TDS category. The role of radioactive iodine in Hertel cell is uh, very uh, controversial. Uh, most uh, withhold radioactive iodine. Uh, some people uh, just take the, uh, chance or uh, and, and administer radioactive iodine, this study shows that uh, there is a potential uh, to be investigated and uh, perhaps the same mechanisms of uh, reversal of fortune uh, could apply in uh, Hertel cell carcinoma as well. All the recurrences uh, were in the unfavorable TDS category of note. Now, the uh, current risk stratification is a prognostic risk stratification. ATA, uh, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk categories. 
2009, additions in 2015. And this classification is uh, further refined by uh, Dr. Tuttle, and you listened to his talk uh, earlier this morning. Um, we are getting better and better in prognostic risk stratification. Uh, the problem with prognostic risk stratification is that it aligns the intensity of the therapeutic interventions, including surgical treatment and subsequent radioactive iodine therapy and TSH suppressive therapy with clinical outcome risks. This typically results in more aggressive interventions for high-risk patients and less aggressive therapies for low-risk patients. And unfortunately, as uh, Dr. Fagan nicely showed, uh, in most high-risk patients, tumor is less differentiated to respond or less responsive to radioactive iodine. So the total thyroidectomy uh, being linked to uh, uh, radio radioactive iodine treatment is then less likely to achieve its primary goal. Furthermore, prognostic risk stratification, uh, it, although it's improving, it creates this uh, inconsistent treatment outcomes. Inconsistent treat, treatment outcomes is, is the result, uh, is the reason for uh, what I call an equipoise, uh, not having an agreement on the uh, validity uh, efficacy of surgical treatment, extent of surgical treatment, and uh, radioactive iodine treatment. To support this disparity between uh, prognostic risk factors and uh, theranostic power of radioactive iodine um, and the molecular profiles, um, looking at the clinically aggressive cancer profiles, um, ATA high risk, intermediate risk, and low risk categories, most of the high risk patients are in the zone of uh, more negative TDS values, 80%. Uh, and in the low risk category, the uh, negative values are uh, 30%. This creates a, a mixed bag, mixed package. And this mixed package is the source of the equi equipoise. The state of affairs as to the extent of thyroidectomy and the appropriate use of radioactive iodine today still stand an, uh, at an equipoise. Uh, what can be done differently? Yes, prognostic risk stratification is very important uh, to decide risk for recurrence and risk for uh, death from disease. What we want to know which patients are better candidates for radioactive iodine, thus uh, total thyroidectomy. Based on collection of clinical imaging cytology and molecular cytology preoperatively and surgical pathology postoperatively, uh, one can uh, make better and more predictive, predictive of the treatment outcomes decisions. Preoperative molecular profiling continues to improve the provi uh, to provide prognostic information. Uh, Theranostic risk st st stratification may prove to have a real power in determination of the therapeutic values of total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine. Many people obviously in this business uh, are well familiar with Theranostics, uh, but in, uh, for those who may not be, determination of molecular target or mechanisms using a diagnostic method or technology for a specific molecular, radiomolecular therapy, and in my case also surgical and interventional therapy, is known as Theranostics. Preliminary data as to the perioperative teranostic risk stratification strongly suggests that TDS may have a teranostic power. The TDS has to be refined, though. Uh, we're not uh, quite sure that 16 gene panel uh, is the ultimate panel for um, quantification of quantitation of uh, the uh, therapeutic and diagnostic potential of radioactive iodine. Treatment outcomes may become more predictable and consistent 
and peronostic risk stratification may actually disrupt uh, the state of equipoise. Diagnostic value of molecular cytology was discussed uh, extensively by Dr. Nikiforo uh, yesterday with Tyroseq. Uh, V3 uh, has an excellent uh, negative predictive value and reported positive predictive value is 66%. Of course, this is, uh, if you see molecular uh, cytology, molecular profiling uh, as a uh, diagnostic test only cancer, no cancer, distinction only. But if you look at it uh, in a different way, uh, if you see the test as a teronostic test, where uh, every positive result means something, not necessarily clinically correspond to a malignant cytologic or uh, histopathologic diagnosis, such as RAS, uh, RAS mutations. RAS mutations, 50% of the RAS mutations are not cancer, but NIFTP or follicular adenoma, both of which could be the early stages of uh, neoplastic transformation, therefore means something. In that context, when we looked at it, we, we ran a um, uh, open trial uh, in 2017 and uh, it concluded the same 97.7% negative predictive value. And then uh, instead of using a uh, positive predictive value, we came up with the positive prognostic value and every patient in follow-up, uh, the tyrosic result uh, was, the tyrosic result proved to be uh, clinically helpful uh, in understanding uh, the, the mechanisms or decision-making. Establishing peronostic value of TDS is the research direction. Uh, the initial platform uh, could be, should be metastatic structural disease so that you can uh, validate the concept. The differentiation index being iodine physiology, um, this should include uh, radioactive iodine imaging. Um, we propose I-124 for a number of reasons uh, we discuss in different platforms, that is the most ideal uh, modality for quantitation for dosimetry purposes. Uh, this is the direction we're heading. Uh, and it is time to redefine the appropriate coupling of surgical treatment and radioactive iodine therapy in the context of theranostics. Molecular theranostics refers to selection of appropriate therapeutic interventions based on patient and tumor specific data regarding genomic alterations and, and their transcriptomic and proteomic expressions, which are the primary determinants of radioactive iodine oncophysiology. It has the potential to devise patient specific interventions, including surgical treatment and radioactive iodine treatment. Molecular teranostics comprises of um, molecular cytology, molecular pathology, and molecular imaging. Well, last word on uh, coupling of radioactive iodine with total thyro th thyroidectomy. Uh, this is my operating room. Everything is, um, uh, everything rhymes with 30, 31, I want 31. Patients are positioned in a 31 degree angle. Bowie is set for uh, 31. Uh, and everyone is cognizant that- 31 degrees, Bowie's at 31, 31. Everybody in the room is 31 years old. Bowie's at 31. This is to teach uh, and remind young surgeons that uh, total thyroidectomy for uh, cancer is performed uh, with having uh, I-131 treatment in mind. Uh, I will end here. Uh, this is our uh, Miami Thyroid Oncology Consortium third project on molecular theranostics that I mentioned earlier, uh, looking at tumors, uh, molecular profile, differentiation score, and uh, kinetics by I-124. Thank you very much.